Breaking news on this Saturday night, another potential spy balloon detected, this time in our airspace. The unidentified object shot down over the Yukon. The scandal at City Hall. I recognize that permitting this relationship to develop was a serious error in judgment. Fallout from the in-office affair ending Toronto Mayor John Tory's tenure. <laughs> Earthquake anguish. The bodies can be seen. We can see them but cannot take out. The Turkish town that got help too late. Out with the old and in with the new. Hands down, they're the largest economic driver in Canadian and U.S. culture. The Canadian boomers putting a new face on aging. Global National with Farah Nasser. Good evening and thank you for joining us. We begin with breaking news tonight. Earlier this afternoon, Global News broke a story of another potential spy balloon over North America. We now know that moments later, NORAD shot down a high altitude unidentified object. And this time it was in our airspace over the Yukon. Let's go right to our Ottawa Bureau Chief Mercedes Stevenson. Mercedes, what do we know? Well, Farah, what we know so far is that this was in fact spotted on Friday night and it crossed over from the United States into Canada over Yukon this morning. And at that point, uh, Prime Minister Justin Trudeau authorized that it could be shot down. It ultimately was shot down uh, about 160 kilometers from the border with Alaska over central Yukon. Uh, it was flying at approximately 40,000 feet, which is lower than the first balloon, certainly. And there was concern that that could potentially jeopardize uh, civilian air traffic, which can fly it close to that same level. It was shot down by an F-22, which is an American jet, but it was a NORAD jet. NORAD is a binational command, and that means that Canadian fighter jets can shoot things down over American territory and vice versa. So in this case, it was the Americans who got there first. Uh, the chief of the defense staff said the agreement was whoever got there that are the fastest and had the best shot would take it. That was the case. It was shot down about 3.41 p.m. That's about two minutes after we broke the story, Farah, that uh, NORAD was tracking an object that may potentially be another um, spy balloon. At this point, they're saying they don't know exactly what they've shot out of the sky. And by the way, it is a historic first. NORAD has not shot something down, especially over Canadian territory before. So this is really sort of a, a big moment in the history of continental defense. But they're still trying to ascertain exactly what it is. Listen to what the Defence Minister Anita Anand had to say in her description. From all indications, uh, this object is potentially similar to the one that was shot down off the coast of North Carolina, though smaller in size and cylindrical in nature. Mercedes, what happens now? What are the next steps? So Canada will now deploy a team up to Yukon uh, to try to recover the wreckage of this and see what they can find out about it. Uh, it's obviously difficult circumstances when you're talking about potentially a very wide debris field um, and it's February in the Yukon. This will be a group of experts who are capable of analyzing what they're looking at and carefully collecting it, including the Canadian Special Forces. Uh, there's a special unit called the Canadian Joint Incident Response Unit, which goes up when they don't know what kind of materials they might be dealing with and they're looking for possible of things uh, that could have radiation or whatever else off communications equipment. So they will be up there to help with what's called a sensitive site exploitation. And this intelligence and analysis will be shared with the Americans who are also looking into it. And they'll ask the question, is this part of what they believe is a global fleet uh, of Chinese surveillance balloons that are being used? And if so, the question becomes, how does the relationship with China change? And how many more of these are there? Because Farah, senior national security sources have told me they weren't particularly surprised by the balloon because they had existed in the past. But now that they know how to look for them, they might find more of them that they didn't know were there. And now that we know they exist, Mercedes Stevenson, you broke the story and you'll be following all the developments. Thank you. Now to a political bombshell out of Toronto City Hall, where the mayor has stepped down after admitting to an affair with a former staffer. John Tory says he's resigning to reflect on what he calls a mistake and an error of judgment. The mayor built his political brand on respect and honorability. He actually ran on a promise to bring boring back to City Hall. And just four months ago, he won his third term by a landslide. As Sean O'Shea reports, this news has taken the entire city by surprise. 
For a John Tory's sudden resignation came out of the blue, and a day later, the mayor was back in his office. Do you mind if we ask you one question? No, no questions today. Sorry, John. Yeah, no, no questions. Toronto Mayor John Tory coming into City Hall on a Saturday. Here all day. After a stunning Friday night revelation. I'm deeply sorry, and I apologize unreservedly to the people of Toronto. A bombshell admission about a relationship with a 31-year-old staffer. Permitting this relationship to develop was a serious error in judgment on my part. Tory said his conduct meant he couldn't continue in the job. I've decided that I will step down as mayor so that I can take the time to reflect on my mistakes. The story about Tory's affair had been published in the Toronto Star and began with a tip before Christmas and a more credible one a couple of weeks ago. I didn't really believe it. Uh, it just, you know, he's known as no story John Tory at City Hall for a reason. But after some digging, the tip panned out. He's been a mayor that has had a high moral standard on everything. Whatever your difference is with the mayor, he was very well respected on all sides. Tory had just won his third election victory last October. Uh, to work on behalf of the people. Tory came to the job, job promising stable leadership. Succeeding former Toronto Mayor Rob Ford, the brother of Ontario's Premier, who had admitted to crack cocaine use. Tory said the relationship with a 31-year-old staff member began during the earlier part of the pandemic and only ended in the last month. She no longer works for the city. I developed a relationship with an employee in my office in a way that did not meet the standards to which I hold myself as mayor and as a family man. No one's expecting that sort of thing to happen, especially if someone who is supposed to have our respect, you know, represents the city of Toronto. They're never going to be as clean as we think they are. While he announced plans to leave, Tory is very much still on the job. He promised to help in a transition period. Tory's resignation comes at an especially bad time as the city begins debating its budget, one crafted largely by Tory. Soon the city will need a new mayor. There'll be a by-election in spring. Farah. Sean O'Shea at Toronto City Hall. Thank you, Sean. We now turn our attention to southern Turkey and northern Syria. 25,000 people are now known to have died. Entire communities lost after those devastating earthquakes and aftershocks. <laughs> Among the heartbreaking scenes, there have been glimmers of hope like this, but they are becoming even more rare as the death toll climbs. Our Jackson Prosco was the first journalist to reach one devastated neighborhood waiting desperately for help. We want to warn you, though, this report contains disturbing images and it will be difficult to watch for some. Through their tears, the people of Besni wanted us to hear their stories. We are in a very desperate situation here, this man explained. His sister's family was still under their collapsed apartment building four days after the earthquake, along with dozens and dozens of others. This boy told us he crawled out of the rubble through a small hole. His parents did not survive. Residents showed us bodies still visible in the ruins. They showed us video of a trapped woman crying out for help two days after the earthquake. They couldn't save her. One, one woman uh, cried and she was alive and uh, we, we, couldn't, we couldn't save her and she died. But, but we, saw, we saw her. Mustafa Karaja says he phoned every agency and official begging for help for his neighborhood. After a Polish team brought sniffer dogs that found people alive under the rubble, no one came. Here lived, here lived almost 200 people and 200 people and uh, tot totally, totally saved maybe 10, 10 people. And we are calling and uh, going to everywhere, but we couldn't get anything, anything. There's a shortage of the heavy equipment needed to dig into the deepest parts of this crumpled mass. The equipment only arrived on day four. Too late to find anything but death. All of them is, uh, were, were my neighbors. And I, I know them. My sister uh, and her husband, her three kids were living here. Ikut showed us pictures of his young niece and nephews. He showed us where their bodies were. All he wanted was to give them the dignity of a proper burial. <laughs> Four days waiting, but there is still nothing. The bodies can be seen. We can see them, but cannot take out. 
Even with heavy equipment and the arrival of rescue workers, survivors still risked their own lives on the precarious debris, often digging with their hands out of pure desperation. In Besny, they have waited too long and lost too much. Death haunts the living. So does survival. For four days there, and cold, and their heart. And we are healthy, but it's very, very hard for us too. The locals tell us that many people had moved into these newer buildings thinking that they would actually be safer in the event of an earthquake. In the end, it was the new buildings that crumbled. The old buildings are still standing. Jackson Prosco, Global News, Besne, Turkey. Aid workers in the region are providing specialized medical and social supports for children. But as David Aiken reports, there is an increasing need to provide support to the very aid workers themselves. A minor miracle. 130 hours after the earthquake, this four-year-old girl, Sengul Karabasak, is pulled from the rubble of her collapsed five-story apartment building. Another miracle, her father is next to be pulled out of the rubble, but the search for Sengul's mother and hope for one more miracle continues. <laughs> this nine-year-old girl recovering in a Syrian hospital lost her entire family, orphaned by the catastrophe of last Monday. It's just heartbreaking. Um, we don't have numbers at the moment, which is part of the problem. Um, I think those numbers will will emerge, will start to emerge, and that's urgent. Um, I think it's going to be even more difficult on the, the Syrian side of the border. Providing support to children after disasters like this presents its own unique challenges. We often underestimate the, the psychological impact that um, events like these have on children. But the work of finding, saving, and caring for children can take a special toll on aid workers themselves. I think that often gets forgotten that um, often the people that are the first responders in an emergency like this are actually also victims themselves. And that means taking care of the rescuers and the caregivers is a crucial component of the whole aid process. They are also suffering from the trauma. It's not easy to be there for the population and also to take care of your family and yourself. The United Nations will soon play a key role in coordinating aid for the region and that aid will be required for months at least. We have a clear plan tomorrow or the next day to give an appeal for a three-month operation to help the people of Turkey with humanitarian assistance. And we will do some, a, a similar one for the people of Syria. It will be a plan to deal with what authorities say is the worst disaster this region has seen in a century. David Aiken, Global News. The earthquake has also shaken up political power in Turkey. Coming up, why the disaster may have backed the country's president into a corner. The earthquake in Turkey has not only devastated countless lives throughout that country, it may have also flipped the country's political power upside down. President Recep Tayyip Erdogan is set to face an election that he called in mere months. Yet with the magnitude of destruction and the anger over his government's response in the aftermath, his leadership may now be in jeopardy. Eric Sorensen explains. In late January, Recep Tayyip Erdogan announced new elections in Turkey for this May. An opportunity to consolidate his grip on power after 20 years as president. But just two weeks later, the earthquake hit and Erdogan's re-election suddenly faced aftershocks he'd never expected. With thousands dead and villages in ruin, Erdogan declared a state of emergency. The emergency powers will last three months, he said, which would be until just before the election. The next day, Erdogan comforted residents in one of many disaster areas. He acknowledged problems with Turkey's initial response, but later promised that cities would be rebuilt within a year. But many residents, now homeless and in the dark, are angry at the government's response. Is our state so incapable, he says, we have 30 bodies lying here. And with more than 6,000 buildings collapsed, 
The political opposition says regulations have not been enforced. You, Erdogan, are to blame for the disaster, says the president of the People's Republican Party. You and the construction mafia that built without standards while making massive profits. I think the earthquake could, could be a turning point. This analyst says the earthquake could expose the weaknesses in Erdogan's leadership. Critical posts have been filled with uh, loyalists instead of people who have the necessary background. And that makes the country uh, vulnerable uh, and, and compounds um, the, the problems when a disaster like this hits. Another potential presidential rival is Istanbul Mayor Ekrem Imamoglu. He has criticized Erdogan's imposition of emergency powers. Restricting social media and internet communication, he says, represents fear of the truth and weakness. Erdogan could, however, use those powers to political advantage. He can further limit uh, uh, the, the room for maneuver uh, of these political parties and political actors, which is a huge concern uh, ahead of the elections. Erdogan is a pivotal figure on the world stage. He has deftly navigated membership in NATO while maintaining dialogue with Russia's Vladimir Putin. But for now, he will need all his political skills at home to persuade the people of Turkey before the coming election that however grim the death toll from the earthquake, he and his government are not to blame. Eric Sorensen, Global News. A sound body and mind ahead how the Special Olympics is boosting the mental wellness of its athletes. Whether it's staying fit or basking in team spirit, there are plenty of reasons for anyone to get involved in sports. But a new study is underscoring the benefits such experiences provide for athletes taking part in the Special Olympics. Our Catherine Ward explains data shows that taking part in these sporting events can be vital to the mental health of those with intellectual and developmental disabilities. For more than 12 years, Carly Bryden has found joy in sport, learning to swim, shoot hoops, and participate in rhythmic gymnastics. It allows her to feel like she's, you know, a part of something. Carly has Down syndrome. Every new skill is a victory. She could never get the ball to the basket. She didn't have the strength. By the end of the second year, she got her first basket. And to be able to see that accomplishment and that effort, and you know, all the volunteers were cheering and clapping and crying. When COVID-19 forced Special Olympics to pause its programming, it was difficult. Carly's dad said her anxiety increased. She became more isolated and then stopped talking. It was heartbreaking for all of us in the family. And it was frustrating at times. We couldn't understand, you know, why can't you speak anymore? And it, it was truly, it was devastating for the whole family. New research indicates a strong link between sport and mental well-being for athletes with disabilities. The data compiled by ICES was collected over 20 years and looked at 51,000 people. Participation in Special Olympics halved the likelihood of developing clinical depression. We think it's the combination of the exercise and the physical activity and the social connectedness. It confirms what organizers have felt for years. A year ago, they were struggling in, in isolation at home, not getting out, and now they have a chance to sort of be back out in community and what that has given to sort of lighten them and bring positivity to their life is incredible. Making returning to sport even better. And for Carly, the words following not far behind. <laughs> Catherine Ward, Global News, Toronto. Next, you've heard of influencers. Now meet the old fluencers, the baby boomers that are reinventing what it means to age. It's hardly a secret that we live in a youth-obsessed society, yet baby boomers are considered the largest and the most influential generation in history. And a number of them are going online to put a new spin on getting older. As Marianne Demain reports, they're busting down stereotypes along the way in a realm usually dominated by young Canadians. Only you know what you're capable of. They're living longer, they have more time on their hands. Is this the largest hat you've ever had on? Yes, by far. And their buying power packs a punch. Meet the old fluencers, aging proudly on their own terms. I'm training my glutes today. 
like Joan McDonald, who started exercising at the age of 70. And Montrealer Grace Ganem, who at 58 is considered a fashion icon by her followers. My mother gave me good advice. And Vivian Boyko, a grandmother in Saskatoon whose videos have attracted millions of views. Our age faces a stereotype that we're done. We've raised our families, you know, now we're just going to sit in a chair and that's not the way it is. We're out to learn new things and we're seniors out to have fun. They're part of a generation that's healthier, wealthier and changing the narrative surrounding aging. I think they're quite different. First of all, they're a lot more active and I think they're also interested in doing things and remaining quite involved in social activities as opposed to the way we might have thought of people in that demographic 20 or 30 years ago. Sabah Kwao is Chief Creative Officer for Cassette, one of the largest marketing and communications companies in Canada. Hands down, they're the largest economic driver in Canadian and U.S culture. Baby boomers represent more economic impact than millennials X and Z combined. Yet only one in 10 marketing dollars is directed at an older demographic. Caddis Eyewear takes the opposite approach. Our mission is to introduce a, a new idea to pop culture and the culture at large that basically says uh, the age that you're at is the right age with a message that is loud and clear. Once you get to these ages of 40, 50, 60, 70, you actually realize that this is the holy grail. And the old influencers are proving to the world that their voice has value. Vivian is approached weekly by companies wanting her to promote their products. Farah? Oh, I just love that. Marianne Domain in Toronto. Thank you, Marianne. And that's Global National for this Saturday night. I'm Farah Nasser, and on behalf of our whole crew here, I want to thank you so much for spending part of your Saturday evening with us. Tonight's Your Canada is the Light the Night event in Calgary. Until tomorrow, take care of yourselves and take care of each other. Good night. <laughs>